Okay. Um, thanks for the introduction, Naresh. Um, but I suspect you know who I am. Uh, I'm Dean Leffingwell. I'm here to talk about the Scaled Agile Framework. I have about an hour. I'm going to um, take a fairly deep dive into a few kind of technical areas and then kind of resurface at the end and talk a little bit about some of the benefits associated with the framework. I want to start with a statement of the problem. Um, as you can tell, I'm basically old now. It's pretty hard to, hard, hard, hard to admit otherwise. Forty-some years in software development. And 20 years ago, frankly, we didn't think it would work this way. 20 years ago, we thought we would be sitting at incredibly powerful CAD stations, right? Stations maybe that look, look like this. We we're going to work like that. And, and we were going to create, you know, wireframes and automatically create the code and have executable models and have all these higher levels of, of abstraction that, that would be suitable for the machines that folks like Gordon Moore were building us. So I, I blame our problem on Gordon Moore. If he hadn't doubled the, the power of every microprocessor every year for the last 20 years, we wouldn't have such incredible systems. And, and cooperating with that trend is, is the notion of imagination. Right? Um, how many here are in kind of product or program manager positions who determine what needs to be done? Can you imagine far more than the teams can actually do? Do you ever run out of imagination? No, so we have an incredible imagination, we have incredible resources, and we thought we would be working right now like this. We thought we'd be working with, you know, individuals working at workstations and dragging and dropping and, and uh, executing state machines and building models that were executable. I was involved in, uh, in the UML in those days, creating highly specific models. But I think in reality, a lot of the times it feels more like this, right? And in a way, these folks have an advantage, they're co-located. Right? We're not even co-located. So the reality is instead of dealing at these incredibly high levels of abstraction, we deal at pretty low levels of abstraction and we deal in a world where essentially any developer or tester working on any program of any size, up to and including some of the largest programs you can imagine. Uh, I left a company last week with 3,000 people working on a single application suite. That's pretty scary. Any one of those people can basically take a system down, right? Uh, any two people can make a misassumption and bring a system down. So what has happened is, we, have we really been able to keep pace with our methods? I mean, ask yourself the question, have our methods kept up with the challenge that we're facing? And I think the answer is they haven't. And that's why we, that's why we continue to, we can continue to, to struggle and, and try to build these amazing systems one line of code at a time. But before we launch into kind of the Agile discussion, we have to remind ourselves of a couple things. Number one is we do have a choice, right? So if you're, if you're in an enterprise and you're thinking about an Agile transformation, this is the simplest graphic I've ever been able to come up with that explains the choice. We can choose to move forward with our requirements and specifications and implementation and leave the risk to the end, do that integration and, and, and see the big bang at the end. Or with the tools and technologies we have, Maybe they haven't quite kept pace, but they're a lot better than they were, right? We have, we have unit testing for everything now. We have, we have great high-level languages. We, don't, we, we can do OO without even thinking about object orientation anymore. We don't even talk, talk about it. We do it naturally. But your choice is to start building a box and delivering a box very early or deliver documents. And I'm reminded of this, and I, I, I highlighted this slide because the place I was at just a week ago, I think it was a week ago, it's a pretty big company. And they had a, an S, a, a scrum team, if you will, that consisted of about 30 requirements analysts. And they ran in four-week sprints. So they would run two or three sprints at a time, and they would create a batch of requirements. And then they had these other agile teams that were the development teams. And the development teams would then create the code, and they would sprint as well. They were sprinting, and they were agile. And those development teams were also run by a scrum master. And then they had the test teams, who were also agile teams. What's wrong with this picture, right? They've just chopped that big, the top diagram up in little bitty pieces and said, we're going to be agile now and we're going to use agile words to describe what we're doing. But agile isn't about that. Agile is about the ability to create a very small amount of value in an extremely short time and then to, and then to incrementally build that value over time. And the reason we do it is simple. It's simple economics. And I remember being in a debate with a, an enterprise 
um, key stakeholders and some key critics where the enterprise was talking about the fact that they had increased their releases to market to four times a year up from what had been one time a year. And the critics were saying, well, of course you could do more releases if they're smaller, right? It doesn't really matter at that point. You've accomplished nothing really of value because you've taken the big release and you've, you've divided it into four smaller chunks. But we know different. We know that that first release is already out there and the second release is already out there. And you have integral, in, uh, integral value over that period of time. So while we're waiting for the waterfall to deliver a piece, we have actual working code in the hands of our users. And even, even if it isn't perfect, we're getting feedback from that. And we're getting the data we need to evolve it. And another interesting thing about agile development in general is the second kind of piece of economics is that the market really only wants to pay for differentiation. So at the top of this, at the left side of this curve, what you see is the value of anything unique the value of a feature over time. And over time, features become commoditized, right? Over time, everybody, every competitor, every application, everybody in the business can do that thing. And that thing becomes a very low value. So we need to strike when the iron is hot. We need to strike when, when it's a very early time. I usually have my iPhone, I have a timer here right now, and I tell the story about buying my first iPhone. I paid $600 for that phone, which is a ridiculous amount of money. It didn't, this was before there was an app store, this was before there was no GPS, there was no compass on the phone. The, the, the camera was a joke. I didn't work for those guys, I worked for some of their competitors that had awesome cameras on their phones. The camera was a joke, the kind of camera you'd buy your kids or grandkids at Disney World for underwater photography, right? And I got my phone from AT&T, and in the US, I don't know if you follow that whole fun rollout, but, but I couldn't even make a phone call, right? So I had spent a ton of money for a device that was basically crappy phone, but it was a really cool office in a pocket, right? And, and so the value had changed from a, an eight megapixel uh, uh, camera that could take video to my ability to check my calendar, get my email, synchronize my contacts, and move on with my life. And on a good day, standing near enough a tower, I could make a phone call, right? So that was worth a lot to me, even though it wasn't much of a phone. Um, a lot of people did that. A, a couple, three million people paid that kind of money for that phone. That's a $200 phone now on a contract in the US. Does anybody know where that money is, where that cash went? That two or three million people paying four or $500 extra for a phone. Yeah, where'd it go? Who took it? Who has the, who has the money now? Apple. They have $150 billion. When the phone price went to $200, they didn't send me any money back, right? They kept the money. So the important thing about agility is not so much how we feel about it or some of the amazing cultural effects. Those are, those are, those are tangible benefits that, that we get a great benefit of. But the drive for agility is pretty simple. Get to market sooner. And you can get to market sooner with a high quality product for less. Read the book Rework or Lean Startup. Any of those that basically say, you know, if we can get there early and get some feedback with a high quality product, we're going to win in that market. Now I want to introduce Lean and introduce the framework, but I want to start with a few kind of key thoughts here. Let's talk about agile methods. Have you ever noticed how the various methodologists seem to argue with each other? Why are they arguing with each other? Let's take a look at Scrum. I didn't invent it. I had nothing to do with it. When I read it, I realized something for the first time. After all my experience with various methods, I realized what a good cross-functional software team was. Seven plus or minus two people and a product owner with content authority. That construct didn't exist before. I thought, that's brilliant. I worked in the Rational Unified Process. We had lots of roles and responsibilities, but there was no definition of a team. That definition of a team scales. Scrum is ubiquitous. The Agile Alliance in particular has done a, a phenomenal job of, of creating a, an industry of people that can, can teach Scrum in, in ways that are enough alike to have a common framework, a common way of working for an Agile team and to know what an Agile team is. Isn't that a pretty cool breakthrough, right? As of like 28, 2008, 2008, 2009 to actually understand what an Agile team is? Let's use it. Let's sprint. Let's leverage the shoulders of the, of the folks that we're standing on and put that to work. Why wouldn't we? 
whatever happened to extreme programming? You saw Martin Fowler up here today say, what happened to extreme programming? Um, I actually got tipped to Agile, not for Scrum. I saw that as a lightweight but effective software project management technique. But I sat down with a couple of extreme programmers and, and kind of pretended to pair program. Now this was past the day that I could actually program anything. So my, my pair programming was watching a real programmer do real work. And I remember the guy, Dave Muirhead, um, was talking about his code and he wrote his code and he put the methods in place and then he started writing some more code around it and it was, this, it was, a, it was a unit test. And I said, well, why, why are you doing that? Why are you writing a unit test? I said, that really adds to the code, doesn't it? And he said, well, yeah, but this is my story. I said, well, what's that mean? He said, well, during planning, we're, we're not assigned work. I take responsibility. I took responsibility for the story. I have responsibility for the story. I'm not going to release this story back into the baseline unless I know it works. And I don't know it works until it's passed the test case. And I thought, well, that is a pretty disciplined approach to software development. I'd never seen that on the bench before. So I got tipped that way. I wish there was still a grand battle out there between Scrum and XP, because that would mean they're both at work. They're both at work and they're both at play. If, if, um, if, the, if those of you a few hours ago attended the, uh, uh, the Nokia presentation, it's, um, it's actually called Here Now. Uh, and, and they talked about their rollout, and they talked about their kind of scrum first rollout. Any, anybody in that session? What did they say they're doing now? What are they doing next? After having largely mastered scrum at the team and program level, what are they doing? Going back to the technical practices, right? That create the quality code to begin with. Okay, well, what about this newer kid on the block, Kanban? How many here understand Kanban? Okay. What's it, what's it optimized for? Managing work in process, limiting WIP, aligning capacity to demand, limiting demand to match capacity. Well, what's wrong with that picture? Nothing. So is this a zero-sum game where I learned XP and I have to believe in that, or I learned Scrum and, and, other, and, and words are banned from various forums because we're talking about different things? Or do we have not only the right but the obligation to harvest the lessons learned and the knowledge gained and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, really the extraordinary changes that have happened over the last 10 years or so. Well, I think it's the latter. So I think these are all good things. I don't argue with any of these people. Well, some I argue with a little bit, okay, just, just for the spirit. But I don't argue, argue at all with the principles or what they're trying to accomplish. This is not a zero-sum game. This is not I can do this, but I can't do that. I can, t I can use that word, but not that word. There are no words that you can't use in SAFE. But let's take it a step further. Those methods work exceedingly well. How many have here have seen a, a, a group of XPers on their game? Okay, what did that look like? Was that some of the fastest, coolest code you've ever seen? How many have seen scrum teams who have that word ba, that Japanese word that says that you know, knowledge and the work are all one? How many have seen scrum teams that are really on their game? Fantastic, right? Nothing like it, in my view. That's what, that's, that's what tipped me down this line. But they don't bring the native constructs, right? We talk about, you, you know, even Kent Beck might say, well, does XP scale? Well, it, it absolutely scales horizontally. There's no limit to how many people could do pair work. But what does, what does a, a, a system architect or a UX person have to do with extreme programming? Or what does a PMO person or a program manager who has a responsibility? They don't write any code. So those things scale great that way, but they don't scale up, right? So they scale the way we need them to scale first, but they don't scale up. So, and what's more, sometimes I wonder, I work with big companies. This is a talk, by the way, about large-scale software development. If you're, if you're a group of 20 or 30 people, and you're largely co-located, and you're working with a, a founder or a, a visionary or somebody that understands what you're trying to build, you don't really need these constructs. This is not for you, you don't have to do this. But I work with enterprises that have thousands of people employed. How many here work for a company that has a thousand developers? Leave your hand up if you believe that currently it's actually pretty hard to write good code and get it to market in that company. More hands went up, not down. It gets exceedingly difficult. Are those folks that work for that, uh, shout out the name of a big company. Just tell me a big company name, anybody. Come on, I know there's, you raised your hand, that means you work for the company. Just give me the name of a company. Pardon? 
General Electric. So did the folks, the, the software development in GE, or the, the software developers in GE and GE Healthcare, who I know are, are, are agile, don't they deserve the same empowerment, the same decision-making authority, the same enjoyment of life that, every, that every, everybody on a scrum team does? Or is there something about GE that means you can't do that? Well, I don't think so. So I think we have more than an opportunity. I think we have an obligation to, to bring some of these methods across and, and, and take them into the larger enterprises and help those enterprises su succeed as well. How do you do that? I saw Martin Fowler's talk this morning. I have a tremendous respect for him. I read most of his stuff. He's, he's a real thought leader in this area. And he said, you know, if you, if you have a couple of arrows in your process, you're kind of already headed down the wrong path. Um, I'm not sure I agree. Now, I didn't go through and take all the arrows out of safe. I didn't have time to do that today. But, but you do have a choice, just like you have a choice between waterfall and non-waterfall. You have a choice to start with a blank slate, okay? And if you're a small team like Spotify, starting off with a few agile teams, or like Salesforce, eight or nine years ago when they were 80 or 50 or 80 people, you do have a choice. You can grow that organically and you can figure out your path. But if you're a larger enterprise, wouldn't it be interesting if you had some patterns that were proven? Scrum works in one team, we kind of assume it works in a second team. Well, what patterns have been proven in the industry? Well, many, right? You heard the, guy from, the guys from Nokia talking about release trains. Well, that's, it's a label, it's a metaphor for an agile program. It's nothing more or nothing less than a program that operates in an agile manner. So over the last five or six years, I and the people I've been working with, including those guys that were on stage, we're looking, we're looking for things that worked well. And I was fortunate because I was a consultant, and here's the way a consultant works. In order to build yourself a, a career as a consultant, for those of you who want to go down that path, you have to start out by knowing one thing, right? And it's got to be pretty precise. But then you take that one thing to somebody who needs to know that one thing, and I'll use you as my foil here and say, I know this one thing. What are you doing well in your company? And every company has an answer. You know, we think we're doing this pretty well, so now I know two things. And I go to the third person, I'd say, I think I've learned one thing, I've learned another thing, I've learned another. So what we've done is really harvest and, and watch companies that have agile, agile at scale and agile at the team level grow and prosper, guide and learn various patterns. And the patterns may or may not work in your environment, but I suspect they will because they're based upon a, a value system. So what's the value system in SAFE? Well, number one, it's code quality because we're talking about scale. I suggest that it's a lot harder to build a high quality system that has 1,000 people contributing to it than, than one that has 50 people contributing to it. And, and the errors and assumptions and the, the buffer overruns and the uninitialized variables and the lack, of, the lack of integration and the lack of communication and the test that I thought actually passed once but was never refactored, it all adds up. So we get this cascading probabilistic effect that if anything is wrong anywhere in the system, it's gonna get worse and worse and not better and better. So we focus on code quality. So if you're interested in SAFE, and, and, I, and SAFE is free, by the way, it's, it's publicly available, that's a website. You can go click on things and find, find, find things. And if it doesn't make any sense, stop reading it. But if it does make sense, continue to read, right? And judge for yourself uh, whether or not you think this thing is gonna work. You can't scale crappy code. Item number two on the list is program execution. How many here are involved in large software programs. Keep your hand up if they're, if, they're, if they're going really well. Six lucky people in the room, right? We do not know how to execute large software programs. Where would we have learned it? Did we learn it in school? No. Did we learn it in the startup that, uh, that had 75 or 100 people? No. Where are we learning how to build really large software programs? In really large software programs. Every one of which is different. So we're all in this massive on-the-job training, right? So consequently, getting programs to execute as well as a team is our goal. So program execution is, 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 a, is, a, is a key element. Alignment. Everybody thinks everybody else isn't aligned, right? Ten teams that are not super proficient, but are reasonably competent and somewhat conscientious, that agree on what they're building, will outperform in the market, 10 stellar teams, each thinking they're building a different thing. And when we align, we don't just, from, I'll be, 
I'll be an executive. I've been an executive and a developer. I've been an executive longer than a developer, so maybe, maybe I've started to lose some of my wits, okay? I've been, been on that side too long. As, as an executive, we look at the developers and say, well, those people aren't aligned. They're building different things. And as developers, we look at our executives and say, those people aren't aligned. They're telling us to build different things. So we have to align both halves, right? We have to make sure that we're aligned to the mission of the business. And we actually use some of our tools like release planning, this kind of massive face-to-face -face release planning, to get alignment on the other side. The fourth bullet there is a proxy for trust. Okay. Um, the scaled Agile framework is not different than Agile. It's not orthogonal to Agile. It depends on Agile. It is fully and completely and 100% dependent upon the fact that good Agile teams can work can build high quality code in a time box. The values of the manifesto, we start with that in our rollout, and one of those is trust, right? Build your projects around motivated individuals and trust them to get the job done. Well, we can't build trust into a framework. You can't, that's a personal relationship. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, uh, a sense that I'll know what you'll do when push comes to shove, but that's a personal thing. But we can build transparency, and transparency helps build trust. Transparency allows you to make mistakes and admit it. To have a poor sprint and have your boss go, ooh, that had to hurt, what did you learn from that? Right? Transparency should allow us to start a program, get into it, discover how hard it is, and decide not to do it. And to not to put the people who are on the program in jeopardy of a career limiting move because we canceled their program. If this program is going poorly and the team reports in that this is a poor program, and we should, have, we should abandon ship. We should congratulate those people, not put them in the penalty box for the fact that this, that this program struggled. So we need all of those things. But we do have a bit of a challenge, and the challenge is, is that as soon as you leave the, the, the bounds of the team, as soon as you leave the hall with a wall of truth and the continuous integration reports and that, and you go upstairs anywhere, you go talk to the system architect or a product manager or a business owner, um, or, or anybody, a, a, an engineering manager or whatever, they don't write code, right? You go talk to the PMO and say, we want to do Scrum. What do they say? Do they care, right? You can do whatever you want so long as it continues to meet our requirements. So I had the good luck to, to, to be raised in some ways in lean and manufacturing. I went to Goldratt School in 1986 and learned the theory of constraints. And by the way, the theory of constraints is still out there. We don't talk about it anymore, but it's working. Theory of constraints is in your environment. There is a bottleneck right now, and all the investment that you're making not on the bottleneck is basically largely wasted. Okay, that's true. But anyway, we needed a broader surface area, and for, that, for, for me, that was lean. And then as we thought about, you know, move forward with this kind of this next generation of, of, of software practices and software processes, we, we find ourselves with three really, really cool bodies of thought. Solving a big problem. No one knows how to build really large software systems effectively. Our results aren't good. We build them, we get a good result, but don't you always kind of feel bad at the end, right? Isn't it like we just shipped a thing that nobody has ever shipped, a combine like the world has never seen, uh, a, a new application, a new website, and yet we go home and we know the phone's gonna ring, it's buggy. And, and has anybody ever come up to you and said, not only did you do it, but that's everything we wanted in the application right on time. You ever gotten that feedback? Or what, what feedback do you get? It's never enough, right? It's never enough and it's never of high enough quality. So if we're gonna solve that problem, we should have some, we should have some pools of thought. And we, we have agile, we have lean system thinking. I'm gonna talk briefly about principles of product development flow. And then we apply that stuff and, th and see what we come out with. So let's, let's look at our metaphor for this thinking process. Let's look at this house of lean. And, and just, I'm just gonna talk about two or three of these. I'm gonna talk about the ones in the middle. I'm gonna talk about the goal. I'm gonna talk about product development flow and I'm gonna talk about leadership, but I'm gonna end with leadership because leadership is key and keen in the model. We're dependent upon this. We're, there was somebody um, recently attended a class and, and this was a pretty, pretty renowned agilist and he, he had some criticisms of what he'd learned there and he said, why are, why are you so defensive of current management? And I don't think we are defensive of current management, but I do think current management is actually present, right? They're there. So are they leaving so we can be more agile? 
They're going to stop it or are they going to lead it, right? The latter course is the one we're going to head down the path, but it's going to take us a little while to get there. So there are a lot of interesting kind of discussions about what Agile is, you know, uh, Agile with a big A and Agile with a little A. Lean has, I think, a simpler paradigm, a simpler goal. Sustainably shortest lead time, period. Not period, okay? Best quality and value to people in society. This is kind of the, the well understood description of lean. Sustainably shortest lead time. Not bursts of high releases, followed by burnout and massive, massive turnover. Not high turnover in general, because that is the sustainably fastest lean time. And we have some, we have some, we have some hints from, from, some, from some of the best thought leaders in the market, all the way back to Taichi Ono, the kind of the godfather of lean, who said, this isn't so hard to figure out how to go faster, right? Figure out what it takes to get from idea, concept to cash. Measure the time, eliminate the waste, and you'll go faster. Well, there's a secret in software development, which our waste are mostly not rework or defects. Our wastes are mostly delays. And I was attended uh, Al Shalloway talked at uh, Staples about a year and a half ago. I think that's. I think that's where Lisa was at the last time we were, we were sitting together. And he, and he put up a, a, a position. He said, you know what? I, I, I believe that, that, that every time that most software problems exhibit themselves as delays. So raise your hands if, you've been in, if you're in a large program right now, a large program that's struggling, OK? Keep them up if you're delivering early, OK? We know what the problem is. The problem is delays. Most software problems will exhibit themselves as a delay. And value stream analysis, which was mentioned earlier today a couple times, is a way to get at that. And, and Mary Papandik, I think, said it even cuter, right? We just need to figure out a way to deliver software so fast that our customers don't have the time to change their minds. And did they really change their mind, or is it the case that more likely the market changed in the meantime? And it's probably the latter the case. Now I want to take you on a short sideways journey before I uh, bring you back. In 2009, Don Reinertsen published uh, his second book in his kind of series on flow called Principles of Product Development Flow. Uh, I'm an author. You probably know that. I, I like it when you read my books. Well, I actually like it when you buy my books. If, you're, if you read them, that's a second order concern, really. Um, and I would encourage you to do that. I write them for a reason. But the only advice I'm going to give you here today in terms of what book to read would be Reinertsen's book, Principles of Product Development Flow. Anybody here read it? Uh, okay, absolutely. Pretty easy read, right, guys? Oh, yeah. Okay. Tough book. Okay, Don is, is uh, he's certainly one of my heroes. He's working on a book. I'm not sure he's going to title, but it's going to be Principles of Product Development Flow You Can Understand. Okay. But there are eight principles here, and I'm only going to highlight a couple, too. I'm not even going to read them all that we use as a constant kind of mantra, and they make us think about software development differently. And, and just a few vignettes from there, right? Just drill deep for just a second. Reducing batch sizes. We don't even think about batch sizes. What's a batch size? What's a batch in software? What kind of, where, where would I see a batch? Somebody give me an idea of a batch. A batch of requirements. A batch of requirements. Let's just take that one. That's a good batch. Let's take a batch of requirements. I'll walk over here and look at this, this chart from Pop and can talk about that a little bit. Now, when we put this batch of requirements, right, small, medium, or large batch, into a system that's composed of software people writing code, what utilizations do we typically run our software teams at, individuals? What percentage allocation are they assigned to work? 100, right? And, and maybe, you know, 110, pretending like there's more time than that. Um, so, what this chart says is that if I have low utilizations, then my batch size doesn't make too much difference because I have the capacity to flex. But as my utilizations get higher and the batch size increases, I start to have extremely high variability in outcomes. Put a lot of cars on the freeway and the freeway is highly utilized, they might just go fine or you might have one flat tire and the whole freeway comes to a halt. Right? It's just the nature of systems. And we are, we, we are building systems, and we're also a system that builds them. So let's take, that, let's take that requirements batch right now, and let's think about waterfall from this perspective of reducing batch size. Here's a big batch of requirements that I'm going to put into a 
system of people running at 100% utilization. What does that chart say I'm going to yield in terms of cycle time? Extremely high variability. High and highly variable. Have we experienced putting large batches of software requirements on top of busy people and getting an extremely variable outcome? Absolutely. We live that life every day. So, so do we just hire people that, have, that are fundamentally brain damaged and aren't capable of actually delivering stuff on time across in India, in, in Serbia, in Argentina, in the US? Or have we built systems that trap people in a really awkward spot? I think it's the latter. I think we built systems that, 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 that are actually quite predictable. It's predictable that a really big batch in a big system is going to go slow. Here's a, we, we'd like to talk about lean thinking manager teachers. That's what, we, that's what we try to teach. Before we teach safe, we try to teach lean thinking. Here's, here's a, lean, a lean thinking thought experiment 101. If you approach a service with a need for service and the service is, service is running at 100% utilization, what is your wait time? What's your wait time? The service is running at 100% utilization and you need service. What's your wait time? It's infinite, right? So doesn't it seem like sometimes when we approach our software teams and programs and we want new stuff, it's an infinite wait time? Because they're running at 100% utilization. There is no capacity for new, for, for new work. One other thought. I never thought about software queues until I read Reinerson's work and now I see them every day. I see long backlogs that are committed, okay? If your team has a long backlog and that backlog is committed, it acts like a queue. Okay, it's not necessarily a first in, first out queue, but it's a queue. I have to ship this stuff, I've made that commitment. The longer the backlog is, the slower your team is. So if you have a crack team, like the best team you've ever assembled in the history of your software development experience, and they have a really long backlog, they are by definition slow, right? Why are they slow? because there's a lot of stuff in line. Here's their backlog, my new thing takes this time. And you can see Little's Law, which basically is a proof of the, the, the theory that says the average wait time is equal to length of the queue divided by the average processing rate. So when you see those queues, when you walk out and try to get a cookie or get a beer, and you start thinking about, well, why don't they, have, why don't they pull the table out so we could service the queue from the other side and cut the queues in half, you're gonna start to think about a lean thinking manager teacher, and then you're gonna look at your software the same way. WIP constraints, largely counterintuitive to many who manage us. Doesn't it seem like the more stuff you put in for work, the more stuff you'd get out? Doesn't it seem like I just shoved a little bit more in the front, the pressure in the system would go up? I, I, I did this talk one time and a guy said, I just, I just uh, put in a water feature. And he's going, I, I can't figure out what was going on. He said, I hooked up the pump, the pump was really great. Um, and, and there's no water coming out the end, and the pump is sitting there, it's running, it's like crazy, there's water in the input. <laughs> What's going on? He couldn't figure it out. So he went out, with, he went out with a drill, and he started drilling holes, and it started squirting. And then he watched the end of the tube, and the more holes that he drilled, the more water came out the end, right? So it was, it, it, the pump was cavitating. There was, there was no, they had so much pressure in the system that nothing could actually leave it. Our software systems work the same way. When you think about work and process constraints, you think about visualizing work, I'm reminded of this, this uh, big visual information radiator, or kind of Kanban board or scrum board or whatever you want to call it. And I found this team, I was helping this team, serious work, people had invested a lot of money, nothing was coming out of this team. Uh, and they had the board, but they didn't have the dates on top and they didn't have the rope. And the rope was actually a, a set of headphones that were broken that I used. So when I got there, I said, how are you guys doing? They said, we're doing great. Here's a Kanban board. So I went up and said, what's, what's, what's today? It's Wednesday. Put the labels up there and took the headphones up there and nailed them up. And now I have a question for you. How is this team doing? What do you think? They're going to land the sprint? Looking good? Looking good? Not looking good at all, right? Not linear flow. They only have a couple days. They have one story and accepted. Here's a thought experiment. What if somebody came in and said, 
ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, from now on, we're not gonna have more than three stories in development and three stories in test at any one time. We're gonna impose an arbitrary whip limit. Prior to that whip limit, if a developer had just finished story six, what would the developer do? What do developers like to do? They like to code stuff. So what would he or she do? Go get another story, right? If there's a whip limit, what does that developer do when they finish story six? They have to go help somebody test. Does flow through the system go up? Is a developer as efficient at running HP Quality Center as a tester? Not necessarily. But does throughput go up? Am I optimizing for throughput through the team? Or am I optimized for individual developers' efficiency? I'm optimizing for throughput. So whip limits is one of those things that you get it and it starts changing behavior. It starts making you think differently about, about software development. Now let's take, let's take a look at the framework and the time we have remaining. Um, I was fortunate 2000, 2001 to have a task assignment to go into an enterprise that was a, a bunch of folks that used to work for me at Rational Software and they had joined a startup and, and they weren't really operating very productively and the CEO called me in to help coach the team. And I had learned new things. I had learned XP and Scrum and I um, put my skills to work, my newfound skills to work with this team. And within about six or eight weeks, the team was, was re-engaged and delivering value. Here's what's interesting. This was the same team I had managed before in another environment. So by a simple change of process, by implementing kind of team level agile, that team was able to get on its game. And their, their pride came back, their sense of pride came back. And they started showing up, the VP started showing up at the board meeting and saying, well, we got that release out on time. Um, and that's awesome. So nothing beats an agile team. Never seen anything like it, right? Not messing with that formula. <laughs> that seven plus or minus two with good, good solid technical skills works great. But we need to do some things, right? We need to align them. And we love user stories because they, they start this process of aligning, aligning the way the team works to the way their user gets value. Now, as the system gets bigger, those stories get funkier and funkier. Pretty soon, I'm just building a web service or I'm, I'm refactoring uh, a, a business rules algorithm or something like that, or I'm parsing a web page looking for entities and I'm having a hard, hard, hard time finding my user, but maybe my user is another system or maybe my user is a GPS device on a tractor, but the user story form still works great and, and, and we love it. Um, I don't know if you know about my history, but I've written a lot of words about software requirements and sold a ton of books on the topic. I wish I would have invented user stories. They really aced me on that. Jeffries or whomever came up with that, or, or I, I think maybe it was Ron, I'm not sure, um, uh, had a really cool invention. And by the way, a user story is a, a neat, is a cool thing for another reason. It's an object. It's a small object of value. It's a small object of functionality. And our requirements were never that, right? They were stories and they were pages, but they were never really objects. And now all of a sudden we have kind of an object approach. I can measure a user story going through the system. But woe be unto you if you try to scale crappy code. You get really big, crappy systems that are extremely hard to debug. So we double down in our rollouts, and, and we want to first talk about these basic practices. Now, we have one here that doesn't occur uh, in any earlier kind of, kind of XP-derived work. We talk about architecture quite a bit. Why? Because your enterprises are building really big systems, and they have to hang together. So it's a really different, a different paradigm. Um, continuous integration, test first, refactor, we call it pair work. Pair work is extremely valuable. Pair programming is a bridge too far for many people. Some people just can't stand the idea of two people with one keyboard, or two people with uh, one keyboard just doesn't make sense to them. And also there's a lot of cultural issues. So we don't say you have to do that, we just encourage it because four eyes are better than two for sure. But let's scale a little bit, let's move up the stack. Let's talk about what it takes now to make a system out of all of these teams, those great agile teams. They're coached, they're working, they're largely on their game. But what Deming notes is that systems are really very interesting. Systems by definition are consist of components. That's what makes a system a system. There are various parts that can be replaced by other parts that, that still, that still exhibits this, cause the system to exhibit the same behavior. And there are two systems at work here. There's the organizational system that you're using, and there's the subject system, which is the software you're building. They'll both behave the same way. 
So an agile team will locally optimize. Their inspected app will do that. Can't blame them for that, they should. But we need to optimize a little differently. We need to optimize for the system. So the secret to building system is cooperation, right? In this last talk, if you stayed for those last one, the big message there was communication, right? Communication and collaboration, well, those are other words for cooperation, so that's the secret. So what do we need to do? Well, we build these programs, but I want to talk about the program from a slightly different perspective here before I look at the roles. I might even look at the roles. What does an Agile team do when it sprints, a Scrum team? They plan together. They execute together. They build working software in a time box, some number of entities called stories. They inspect and adapt together. They have a, a content authority, a person who can make a decision for the team, that's the product owner, and they have a scrum master who is a servant leader for the team, right? The program works exactly the same way, right? We plan together, and that can be a trick because it might be many people involved in planning. We commit together, and we commit to a set of PSI objectives, which live right there. What the teams agree that they can do, they execute together, and they inspect and adapt together. And they're harmonized by a single program backlog. A backlog is another cool requirements thing I didn't invent. And a simple placeholder that says, this is the work we're about to do. And if it's in there, we're going to do it. And if it's not in there, we're not going to do it. So alignment happens by, is the thing in the backlog? And if I have five key business owners or stakeholders that want to get stuff done, how do, how do they get it done? They get it in the backlog. And our, our product owner, our chief product owner here, is typically product management, maybe business analyst or program management. So we take this thing called the Agile construct, the Agile team, and we take it up one fractal. We just up it a notch to the next level. But when we do that, we have to change a few rules. It's going to be awfully awkward if in the middle of that program, one team is sprinting in one-week sprints, and another team is sprinting in two-week sprints, and another team is sprinting in three-week sprints, because when were those sprints aligned? Now, we also t you also heard Martin Fowler talk about feature branches are bad, and we, uh, we agree. Everybody agree? Feature branches largely bad? How many here still see feature branches all the time? Right. So they're bad, and we need to get rid of them, but we still have them. So given that we still have them, in the process of getting rid, rid of them, we have to align the sprint boundaries so that we can make sure we can collapse those branches really quick. So if a team is running one-week one sprints, two-week sprints, and three-week sprints, by, only by accident, every six weeks is that opportunity. So we say, let's just align the teams now. Let's, 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 let's align them towards a common thing and, and avoid this problem that we see in Agile all the time, which is the teams are sprinting, but the system isn't. The teams are sprinting. Their component is moving forward, but the system is still largely waterfalling. It's getting iterative and incremental stuff built, but there's no, there's no steel thread through it, right? Might have a steel thread through a single feature, but not through the end-to-end. -end. So the goal isn't really for the team to sprint. The goal is for the system to sprint. And in order to do that, we usually need some help. And that's one of the discoveries. When we put these release trains together and say, okay, well, we're all going to work together. We're going to have a system demo in two weeks. Somebody says, well, who can run the system demo? We have five different configuration CM environments and five different CI environments and four different platforms and they're spread all over the globe. We've got three test labs and nobody has an Oracle license and, and nobody can get a copy of, of LoadRunner do load testing. So we have to resource that problem very early on in the process and go from there. But I want to make a thing clear that the big picture doesn't make really clear. And by the way, big picture 3.0 will make this much clearer. So by the way, so safe isn't done. I don't know how, there's no definition of done for safe. The definition of done for safe for me is when I'm too old or senile to be able to contribute, okay? And there'll be some other people. Because I don't believe that you have yet figured out the very best way to develop software at scale. If you have, we'll stop safe. But as long as you're learning, we're going to learn too. So we're at version 2.5. Uh, version 3.0 comes this, comes this fall. We'll start laying it into the, uh, into the framework pretty quick, sometimes in a month or so, you can start to see the changes. But one of the things that you can infer from Big Picture 2.5 that we don't like is that these big blobs, these PSIs, those are the releasable points. No, those are the cadence-based planning points. They're really, they're, really what, they're really planned super increments. They're just this big blob here 
when we've planned and committed to that, but we can release at any time. So we want to do what we do best. We want to develop on cadence, but deliver on demand. We want to separate those concerns because it's not often the case. I mean, maybe you're salesforce.com and, and you ship every eight weeks after a couple sprints, but maybe you're, maybe you're NetApp and you ship five times a day, or maybe you're a company for whom shipping every 10 weeks would blow the mind of your customer who wants to reinstall a new version of SAP every 10 weeks. Anybody volunteering for that? No, right? Some things are just too, too disruptive at this point in time. So we, we want to make sure that we separate the concerns, develop on cadence, and deliver on demand. And then we think about this system again, and we think about what holds that system together? What, what gives it its purpose in life? What is its aim, and where does its aim come from? I couldn't have more respect for software developers. I've built my whole career by essentially translating for them, right? Translating from the technical speak to the business speak and saying things like, my chief scientist didn't really mean to say that you were the stupidest user he ever could imagine. What he meant to say was that he could have done a better job on that particular part of the UI, right? I would translate, make that translation and, and get, get, get through the meeting with my life that way, and on we went. And the domain expertise, make no mistake about it, the people that know the most about the system you're building and the domain you're in are the people that are writing the code. But they're not the ones who have to determine what the strategy of the enterprise is. That's a different problem, right? That has to be left in the hands of the fiduciaries who are chartered to do that. They're the pros, and by the way, they have the money, right? That's where the money comes from, that's where our paychecks come from. So they're the ones that, make, that, that have to make that decision, we have to respect that. So in, in, in SAFE, we represent that as portfolio vision, and it's something that we want to have expressed. We want to know what you're thinking about. What are these new initiatives that are going to head that way? We like to think about, well, strategy is a thing that gets centralized, but, but execution, we, we can do that. Let us handle that. T tell us where we need to go. Give us the vision. Let us do the actual program execution. And you see there, we picked a Kanban system just as one way to express the way, we, the, the, way the large initiatives uh, work in that model. We also find the PMO. Uh, raise your hand if you're a big company, please, or you work for one. Keep your hand up if you have a PMO. Okay? Pretty unanimous. They're there, right? So what do we do? Your dog doesn't hunt anymore? We don't need your SDLC? We're not going to attend that design review? We don't do milestones? We're agile? We're going to build the right thing? Or we start to... Oh, here's another question. Where do you think they learned how to govern waterfall development? Who taught them? I think there's a school that they go to that there's some secret people that come in and say there should be a milestone called design complete. Who, who taught them that stuff? Michael, who taught them that stuff? We taught them that stuff, right? Because that's the way we were building systems. So we said this is the way we need to be measured. Well, guess what? We're not building systems that way anymore. But they're still measuring us that way. But before we go in and just bang them on the nose and say you, you, your, your dog doesn't hunt anymore, we don't need that, We've got to have answers for them. And I originally, the first, very first version of the big picture I drew was an informal, just kind of a sketch on the board to show a PMO what the after case looked like. How funding would flow, how programs would execute, how agile teams would contribute to the value stream, and so they could see the after case. And in so doing, we have to move from the three legitimate functions that they have and start describing how that can happen in a natural manner. Because their responsibility for strategy and investment funding hasn't gone away. And if there's two or 3,000 people, or even 1,000, or even 400, writing software development in a company, isn't it going to be helpful if they have a common way of working? Think about it. I get 400 people, and they all call the thing they do different. They call it a backlog item, a user story, none of the above. They use t-shirt sizes for sizing. They don't size. They have velocity. They don't call it, they don't call it velocity. Um, they have three-week sprints. Um, we're all doing things different. How would we expect to cooperate in a world like that? And then lastly, the least favorite word of the Agile, governance, I guess because it looks like government. But before we throw it out and make fun of it, what is governance really? If a team inspects and adapts, and we expect them to do that, and if a program inspects and adapts, and we expect them to do that, don't 
you think we should have some feedback on our spend? Wouldn't you think that if you're spending, uh, one of the programs I'm working with right now spends $1.7 million every PSI. Don't you think somebody is worried about what's coming out of that? And isn't that a legitimate question? But if the way it's been done is funded a project at a time, rather than fund the release train, if the way it's been done is, hey, your feature is taking longer, please come to the variance analysis meeting and be prepared to defend yourself, right? Then you're in a weird world. You're kind of in a blame game in the middle of R&D. I suggest that you probably, how many of you feel like you're doing research and development? In de developing applications. And how many of you have the research teams right beside you? You don't. We do our research in situ, right? We invent our new things and take all the risk of that in, in, right in stride at the same time. And if you get involved in discussions about, I like this method, I don't like this method, uh, this is a question for the group. How would you measure a framework or a method? What, what would matter? There are five methodologists up here describing various frameworks. What are the measures? What makes one good or bad? Sh shout it out. Tell me something. What matters? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Uh, it's just too, too far back from my weak ears. Fit for purpose, right. What matters? Why do we do this work? To get results, right? So if you want to measure a framework, look at the results. Let's just take a look at a few results. Mitchell International, 40% decrease in post-release defects, 70% decrease in time to respond to customer requests. That's more fun, okay? I'm not a person who starts with the cultural aspects of the cultural change formation in the, in the enterprise. And the reason I don't start there is because it's so hard, right? It's like changing the company's personality. There are people that are better than that than I am. But what I've discovered is that if you can get teams to deliver higher value more quickly at higher quality, they start having more fun. It's a lot more fun to come to work. So you can change the culture, a team, a program at a time. Telstra, Australia. Six times increase in delivery frequency, 50% cost to deliver production. Uh, John Deere, been building combines, and they're actually not combines, been plowed since 1867. Warranty expense, first year of scaled agile adoption, was down 50% year over year. That's a pretty big deal. Infogain, I don't know, I think, I don't know if they're in, if they're in Bangalore or not, uh, involved in subcontracting. Their view, and many of your view, is on the receiving end of a kind of an awkward process where in the end you're told to write this piece of code for some purpose you don't even understand anymore, okay? That's not the model with, with, with a framework. The model with a framework is that everyone is on an agile team. Everyone deserves to understand the mission. Employee engagement goes, goes up. Turnover goes down. Winning is more fun. So how do you do this? Let me tell you by analogy. Um, I, was in, I was involved in, in, in the 80s in, in some lean manufacturing transformations, right? Places where, 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 where buyers went into suppliers and helped them make their plant more lean. Why would a buyer invest their time and money in making a supplier more lean? What's the principle at work here? Get, they get better product. You're not very lean. Your costs are too high. Your quality is too low. It's hurting me. And here's the way it would work. They would say, hey, we, we're here to help you, seriously. We're not even going to charge you a nickel. But, and, and, and we want to teach you lean manufacturing. And they would take the leaders and the managers aside for lean boot camp. Okay, a little bit of training. Anybody have an idea about how much time that averaged? Day or two, a few hours, what do you think? Two weeks? Two to six weeks. So I'm a manufacturing manager, and I go to Lean Boot Camp. And on the way to Lean Boot Camp, I walk by my finished goods inventory with a sense of pride. Look at all this stuff. Three weeks later, I come back. Look at all the stuff we haven't sold yet. What were we thinking? OK? They have a lobotomy, right? And, and, and work in process used to be an asset because I can reduce my expenses because I can, I can relieve that cost of my labor, and now it's a liability, and now I want to get rid of work in process. They didn't walk onto the floor and start teaching people in the manufacturing cell different ways to, to build product. 
They taught the managers to teach the people to build product. Here's a question. You are the change agents in the market. That's why you're here. Think about your managers and your peers. How much training in Lean and Agile have they had? How much did they know about this new paradigm? How many hours or days? How, much, how many books have they read? How many books are open on their desk? Not so many, okay? However, they are our leaders. You are our leaders. You're here for that reason. And the expectation, when I started down this path eight or 10 years ago in these transformations, my first expectation to managers was that you'll be supportive of our change. My, my second expectation was that you'll, be in, you'll, you'll understand the change and you'll help us eliminate impediments. And after about five years, I woke up and said, whoa, too low of expectations. My expectation now is that you will lead this change. And in the last major transformation I was engaged in, we had an ask. We asked the enterprise, big company, 1,000 people, 1,000 uh, thousand developers worldwide um, in a world of hurt, competing with really, really good uh, uh, companies, uh, particularly in China and Korea, in the consumer electronics market. And they said, we would go down the agile path. And I said, OK, here's the ask. We've learned some lessons. The first thing we would like to do is to train all the, light, all the leaders and managers. And we'd like two days, not two weeks, two days. Just give us two days. And what do you think the enterprise said? They're too busy. Too busy. And you know what we said? So are we then. We're not going to do it. OK? And they said, OK, we're going to call that. And we had then scheduled about 160 managers in five to eight countries. And we went around. We had, we had a two-phase plan. The first phase was we were going to teach them lean and agile thinking. And because we had a beefy, capable, agile working group, the second phase was we're going to come back and help them transform their shops. We did the first phase. We executed. We went around the world. My wife still, won't, still remembers that trip. She's saying, well, whatever you do, don't do that again. OK, you go to India, how long are you going to be gone? OK, as long as it's not like that other trip, you're OK. okay. Trained them all. Went back around six or eight months later. Visited many of these people. We're ready, and they're here to help. What did they say? We're good. Don't really need it. How come? They knew what they needed to do, right? They were trained. And they said, we can do this. There was no mystery or rocket science. There's no secret sauce or secret handshake in this stuff. This is basic discipline of understanding the way work flows, understanding the agile methods. Rebuilding trust in the system, building transparency, we got it. We can take it from here. Extremely successful program. Company turned on its ears. I got, I got an email just a few, few weeks ago from a VP there who said, basically, if we hadn't have taken those methods to heart, and if the leaders hadn't taken and executed that, we would never have survived in this marketplace. But we didn't do anything. We didn't write any code. We didn't even coach the teams. All we did is train the leaders. So there's a difference between Agile and Lean. Agile is about the teams, and, and gosh, we love them. They do all, all the work. They write all the code. But Lean is about thinking about the way the enterprise works. And Lean is about engaging the people that are there, not some group of managers that are going to come in after we fire everybody that's already there. But give credit for the people that are there. You know that, the thing about the manifesto about trust them to get the job done? Is there a statement in there that says, and trust your management to not be completely incompetent? No, OK? But, but we have to do that, right? Start with the assumption that these are intelligent people that are also locked in a system that's fundamentally flawed. And when they see how to change the system, they will. And when they will, you'll win. That's it for me. And that's the end of my pitch. I'll, I'll take one question. I'm at my 60-minute time limit. I respect your time box. And there's probably dinner out there but I would be insulted if I didn't get at least one question to answer. So just give me one. Somebody give me one question. Go. Middle management is always a challenge. So it is. Absolutely. They, 
they fear. Right, so here's the thing. So one of my customers called that the permafrost, right? The permafrost layer. It's pretty soft from an executive standpoint. It's really malleable. But if you're underneath it, it's hard as a rock. We take that on directly. And we, we, we basically train them. We show them the new model. And make it very clear that there are roles for leaders in this organization. And when you see people start to understand lean agile way of working, they start moving through the organization and become the future leaders. And we also make it clear that not everybody has to be on that bus, right? Because the executives have laid the direction. Here's the role of middle management. It does get leaner. We've got to be frank about that. I've never yet seen a talented middle manager who gets it leave the enterprise. Never seen it. So just go right at it. Give them the tools they need. Give them the training. Give them the confidence and say, you can do this. You can, you can, you can teach a team scrum. You can read a book. You can, you can learn about TDD. You can read principles of product development flow. You can become the leader they deserve. So middle management is the key. And, and while I didn't go through the list, this list is for them. And on, on, the, uh, on the SAFE website right now, there's an expository document about what those things are and some guidance for how to develop those people. Because when they understand that, Agile is going to fly through the system really, really smoothly. So thank you very much for your time on a late day. And we'll see you around this hall soon.